G'day, this is Matt Cornell from Cornell Engineers. Today we're going to go through the process that I normally follow when I'm checking a set of engineering plans. So a job comes into the, a um, set of plans come into the office and they've asked us to do the engineering. One of my engineers has done up some engineering drawings. Here you can see the engineering, the AutoCAD file here. Um, they've set up a Form 15 ready for me to fill in. I'm, I'm doing the checking. The, so a lot of the work's already been done. Uh, there's a checking folder already, as you can see. So first thing I'm going to do is, is check to see what the client's actually asked for. So we'll open up that email, hey? And here it is. So it came into quotes. It says, Dear Cornell Engineers, can I get you to do the engineering for this house, please? And it as soon as possible. Typical. Um, I have attached the floor plans, truss plans, and soil tests. Let me know if you have any questions. And see, there's the attachments the sample house trust plan, the soil report, house plans, and the trust reactions. Okay, so, excellent. Um, let's just close that for a minute. And we're gonna go back and have a look. So, our system inside the office is when we receive these plans, we put them into the receive folder. The latest plans are always in the receive folder. Um, so those attachments have been saved in here. So let's have a quick look at the house plans. Okay, so it's a sample house. Um, has a set of notes, a, some more notes, a site plan. Um, you'll just realize that some of the details have been removed from this set of plans for privacy. And this job is a little bit old, so some of the standards that have been referenced on these drawings are probably out of date now. Um, but for the purpose of this exercise, it's a pretty clear indication of what sort of plans we get. So here we go, a floor plan. Um, we can see the garage. It's one, two, three, four bedrooms with an alfresco, meals area, family room. So this is a nice house. You can see this hatching around the outside that indicates concrete masonry walls. And if we zoom in here, we'll see that the walls are actually been dimensioned as 190 thick. So that's a 200 series concrete block wall and that's pretty consistent around the outside of the house. With the exception of the alfresco, obviously it's a, a, a probably a, well, a downpipe there, but there's a timber post in that corner. Um, let's see what else we got in this set. So this is the window layout, so maybe there's a bit more information on the windows on this plan compared to the previous plan. The elevations, so this is when the house is finished, the building designer wants us to be able to, and the council in fact need us to show what the house is going to look like when it's finished. So the important things here for an engineer are A, how high the wall is, and that's the garage, so don't forget that that number is for a set down slab. So 2.44 meters or 2,440 millimeters to the ceiling height. And this is the elevation, although the line doesn't line up with the doesn't appear to line up with anything, but that's the ceiling in behind. Uh, and that'll become a little bit clearer when we get to the cross section. So four elevations, front, front, rear, left and right elevations. And we can see also that the roof sheeting is 22.5 degrees. Um, it looks like it's a sh metal sheet roof, color bond roof. Uh, and there's windows and doors and and that's all fairly standard. Here we go with the cross section. So this is uh, the building designer's indication of the trusses. Won't necessarily be true. We have some information from a truss detailer from the truss designer. We'll use that in preference to how the trusses are actually shown. But as far as the ceiling height, here we go. At 2440, 2440 millimeters from the slab is there, so that's how high, when you're standing on the slab, that's how high the ceiling will be. The internal walls, he says, are 70 mil pine stud frames. The outside walls we know are already are concrete masonry, 190 core filled concrete masonry blocks. Okay, and what else have we got going on? So, that's pretty much the last page of this set. This is an abbreviated set for the purpose of this example. Um, so let's see what else we've got. Here's the soil test. And remember a lot of the stuff, the personal stuff, private information has been removed from this. Um, so scrolling through, and again, this is an old 
I'll uh, soil test and some of the, the ways the soil testing were done. I've changed a little bit in this time. Um, in any case, so the soil test has given us an elevator, a photo from the, the street to help us confirm that this is the right allotment. They've given us the site address back on this previous page, which you won't see because it's been removed for privacy. Um, and they've done some soil testing. And they've actually, in this case, used Atterberg limits, which are liquid limit plasticity, plasticity index and linear shrinkage to classify the site to determine how clay, how reactive the clays are on this site. Okay, um, so those numbers are important to us, but not as important as the results, which is this one. Um, they estimate that seasonal changes in, in moisture content in the order of 20 to 40 millimeters, moderately reactive site. Um, so they reckon there's at least 100 kPa, so it's nice firm soil, and they've called it a Class M site to AS2870-2011. So there we have Class M moderately reactive site. There's some um, information on the profile, so when they did the testing, here's what they found as they dug down to the depth that they went. They've gone down to two meters, borehole termination two meters, and there's the profile. So the top 200 millimeters is it? Uh, silty sand overlying, uh, which was fill, sandy gravelly clay fill, silty sand alluvial, and sandy clay alluvial, so natural soils down starting at about 500 millimeters depth. Second borehole, because they need to do two. Both of them should be in the footprint of the house. Silty sand fill, overlying sandy gravelly clay fill, overlying sandy clay. So we're reviewing this information as a matter of course as structural engineers. Uh, at the end of the day, we're relying on the soil test, but we'd like to make sure as much as possible that the information that we're using is correct and if we see a discrepancy we're going to bring it to the soil testers attention. So they've done some testing on this material they've done a particle size distribution they provided a, a site plan or an aerial photo rather with the location of where those boreholes are and we'll see I think that those boreholes are within the footprint of the building and then there's just some standard notes, okay. All right, so um, class M soil test. And the only other thing we haven't looked at is the truss plan. And here it is here. Um, nice colorful one, but the thing, and you can see the outline of the building. They're relying on those outside walls, those concrete masonry walls as the load bearing walls and also as the tie down walls for the, and some cases where it's unclear where there's big trusses spanning across the building and they've used the walls of the alfresco they've also nominated these walls will be load bearing as well and they become a little bit more apparent when you see those X's across the wall so they're internal tie down points on internal walls and here's another one but this one's a timber wall so a load bearing wall um, some X's showing that these trusses are sitting onto those walls. Here's the third one. Um, we're going to take that into account when we do our checking of the drawings, make sure our engineer has taken all that into account. So this is now ready for checking. Let's see where we've got those checking drawings. Aha, uh -huh. in the checking folder. <laughs> okay, we're going into the checking. And we'll cut that little bit out, please. Okay, so back into the checking folder now. So the AutoCAD drawings there, the Form 15 is ready. We've gone through the received and the emails. Now we're ready to start going through our own engineering drawings. So let's open these up. So a quick run through the drawings that Cornell Engineers provides for a single story 
concrete masonry house. This is a house in a cyclonic area, a region C. Um, but let's just have a quick look at the layout of the plan. So first is our project specific notes. And rather than call them standard notes, we call them project specific because each and every note is read and check to make sure that it's relevant to this site. And we'll come back to this and do as we do our checking. Some notes on safe design and how to, for, for the building contractor and the homeowner to take into account to um, ensure that the builder and the sites remain safe. And that's just part of workplace health and safety and how we contribute to that. Okay, so sheet four, S4, is our footing plan, footing and slab plan and shows the layout of the footings and slabs, uh, how thick the slabs are, we'll come back to that as well. Um, one, one page of details. This tells the builder and the concrete exactly how we want those footings laid out and how we want them built. The bracing plan is the, the wall, essentially the wall framing plan with some extra notes on where the bracing is. So these areas, the, um, the hatched walls, are going to be plywood walls. Um, and then there's some tie down or hold hold up details, but cyclone areas mainly tie down details. So there's a lot of emphasis on on tie rods, and then finally some bracing details. So as checkers, we're going to, and as designers, in fact, we're going to start top down. We'll start with the very top thing, which is the roof sheeting, which we don't need to check. Um, but the next thing that's supporting the roof sheeting is the roof button. So Let's come in here and have a quick look at the note for the roof buttons. 70, 35 by 70 MGP 12 roof buttons at 600 centers, and there's a connection type, a, a screw, a button screw to each truss, so that looks good. Next, we um, specify the trusses. They're obviously being designed by the truss manufacturer, and we've already seen those those plans. Um, if a different truss manufacturer is used, that's fine, but we want them to use an internal pressure coefficient of plus 0.7 minus 0.5. Trusses can be pine or hardwood um, and the truss manufacturer is, is going to do the design of the truss to truss connections. Finally the truss bracing is going to be specified by the truss manufacturer and the ceiling is going to be, uh, be specified pine buttons. Then there's some notes for the wall framing. We've shown the, in, the load bearing walls, the walls that are helping support the roof we want them to be 90 by 35, so a 90 mil frame, which is essentially about a four inch frame uh, in the old terms. Uh, we've got tie down specified, tie M12 tie rods, um, beside openings, corners, 900 maximum centers, and the non-load bearing walls, these other walls that aren't actually taking load, including the bracing walls actually, um, uh, can be 70, 70 mil stud and the MGP-10 is a slightly lower specification for strength for the, for the timber studs because they're non-structural, they're not really holding up any roof. Here's that note, this is the bit that explains what the hatching on the walls is, that's the bracing walls, and we talk about the capacity of 6.4 kilonewtons per meter. And then we say that we want the builder to connect the bracing walls to the roof frame, uh, and that is using the details on the last page. So that's, that's that little bit covered. We've got a, a single-sided plywood bracing wall detail for 6.4 kilonewtons per meter. How thick the plywood has to be, how it's nailed off. So that's all really good. And how the builder's got a few options here for how we can connect this bracing wall to the roof frame. So we've got that covered as well. So good work on the, by the guys. Because we know it's 200 series concrete masonry walls, we know that the builder is going to need details on how to connect the roof trusses by the truss manufacturers to those concrete masonry walls. And here's our details, how we would like the builder to connect them. So we've talked about threaded rods, talked about, uh, here's a picture of the, of the plate that's going to go over the trusses. Where there's roof beams, we want them to bolt the roof beams to the concrete masonry wall using this detail. Where there's trusses to roof beams, so out on that El Fresco area, well, we want them to use a loop strap to connect the trusses to the roof beam. Uh, what have we else got here? So there, we know that there's some internal load bearing walls. So here we have a detail for rods, tie rods running down the middle 
of the wall, of the load-bearing wall, and connecting the bottom cord of the truss, which is where the truss manufacturer allows us to connect to. And when there's an internal concrete masonry wall, which is that wall on the alfresco, this wall through here, that's the connection detail we want the builder to use. And finally, there's a detail here for how we want the framing tied down. Because it's so important to get load from the roof down to the ground, we show the load path, not directly, but it's all there. So a truss or a rafter sitting on the wall is connected to the lintel, which connects out to the outside beside the opening through a tie rod for uplift down to the slab. Um, and then a couple of studs, jam studs they're called, beside the opening to hold the roof up over that, pardon me, over that area. Um, the last one we haven't checked, had a look at, is this roof beam, alfresco beam to a timber post. So going back a page, here's that connection. We've got a post in the middle, a post on the outside edge. We've called up that roof beam size as an RB2. It's a 195 by 65 hind beam roof beam. The rest of the openings around the concrete masonry are being called up as bond beams, 116S, BB 116S, and there's a detail. For the big garage opening, which is a bit wider, we've got a detail with two 16s, top and bottom, and here's the information the builder needs to build that. Um, where the timber frames abut the outside perimeter concrete masonry walls, we don't want there to be any movement. We, in fact, we want there to be a good amount of strength transfer between the timber frames and the concrete masonry walls. So here we've told the builder fix timber frames to concrete masonry wall with one M12 chem set, which is an M12 epoxy bolt, bolt that's glued into the concrete masonry at top plate, so the top of this wall and at mid height. And that's going to stop those walls moving around independently of each other. And that is pretty much our standard note. We use that and we expect to see those bolts on all these internal walls where they abut the perimeter walls. Uh, you can see there's another post in the middle of the, the entry roof and a roof beam size. So going through checking this, I would give that a quick check to make sure I'm comfortable with that size. And finally, I can see there's an L1 size here. So I imagine, here we go, there's an internal load bearing wall lintel and that would be built according to that lintel detail for the timber, which is this one. Lintel tie down detail on this next page. Um, and that actually looks like a cavity slider, so that's a bit tricky. That L1 has to span right across over the top of the cavity. A little trick for, um, for those who aren't used to checking these sorts of, sorts of things. So this layout, we're pretty comfortable, I'm pretty comfortable that the guys have got the floor plan, the walls all pretty much in the same location as the, as the building designer. Because we start with the building designer's drawings when we put these plans together, we actually copy the building design's information into our plans and sometimes we actually overlay these two plans just to make sure they all work. So the walls I'm pretty confident are the same as the building designer in a full design check. I'd probably do a quick check to make sure we've got all the openings in the right spot and that we're referring to the latest set of building designer's plans. We've got doorway in the entry, we've got some the lintels over the openings, we've got, um, got roof beams out in the alfresco area and posts and the post size has been called up there so that's really good. So I think pretty, sh pretty happy with this bracing plan. So we're working our way down and the next thing we're going to check is that slab plan. So let's get zoom out of here and head over to the slab plan. So we know this is a class M site and our engineer's done a great job of identifying this as an M site and the requirements according to AS2870 for foundation maintenance. All the things that are really important to us to make this house for the homeowner and for the builder to observe to give this house the best chance uh, to resist foundation movement, ground movement. And that's a whole thing that we've, we've got a lot of information of, on that on our website. So the main specification of the reinforcement in the concrete 200 series concrete masonry walls is here. And we talk about bars, where the vertical bars are, which are these dots on the plan. So each one of these dots roundabout is exactly where we would expect the vertical reinforcement to be placed in those walls on site. Um, we want extra bars beside big openings. 
um, this is how we we specify the heavier bars the N16 bars and I'd expect there's probably some over, yeah here we go over beside the garage door which is a bigger opening it's got a bit more load on it and don't forget in cyclonic areas we've got a design for the loads from the garage doors bearing on these these door openings so there's a little bit of extra reinforcement and strength in around the garage door to to strengthen the frame around the roller doors or the panel lift doors in this case probably um, these diagonal bars are crack control bars we call up as per AS2870 that we want 3N12s or 3L12 which is the low ductility reinforcement placed at the re-entrant corners and we've got that required or that requirement rather wherever we've shown these three bars on the diagonal so one two three four five places the slab thickness is shown in the hexagon and the slab reinforcement is shown directly underneath SL82 is 8mm bars at 200mm centers both ways and it comes in a sheet of fabric and you can buy that from Bunnings or from your reinforcement supplier and that's the specification, the way that the build is used to reading it. Um, so the 30mm cover is how high in the slab that mesh needs to be. It needs to be 30 from the top of the slab and from the sides incidentally. Add in the alfresco area which gets wet and dry and 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 rain can land on and gets hosed off uh, we need a little bit more protection to the reinforcement same size reinforcement but we need 40 mil cover so 40 mil of concrete on top over the reinforcement before you hit the slab top of the slab so the strip footing depth we said has been calculated in accordance with engineering principles rather than the straight deemed comply principles and we can use that as structural engineers are allowed to use section 4 of AS2870 there's the advantage of using a structural engineer who knows what they're doing in relation to these jobs a quick check uh, if we weren't recording I'd be checking the spacing of our internal footings our SF1s and um, so we'll have a quick look here we know that there's a four meter spacing requirement to be four meters from the outside of the slab and we know that at changes in direction that we want strength internal beams running both ways so here's one here we know we want this edge beam to continue as an SF1 and the designers done a great job of that and in this location with this direction we want this EB1 to continue as an SF1 so again he's done a great job there in all those locations and all these locations all these internal corners you'll see an SF1 coming off in one direction and in the other direction that gives strength to that corner and that's a requirement of AS2870 a lot of engineers have trouble with that with that requirement but it's really very simple where there's an internal corner like that we want bars to continue to provide the strength the continuity in fact of the SF1 through to the EB1 and that gives the house again the best chance of performing well when there's ground movement. This is the set down area, this is the garage area remember and it's set down a little bit lower than the house so that the homeowner can wash out that area if they want to. So this is the symbol that we use to show that this area is slightly higher slightly higher than the garage area or the garage is slightly lower than the, the main floor slab. We've got another same sort of symbol out here in the in the entry slab but the house slab again is higher than the entry slab so now a quick scan through all those details on a normal checking if I wasn't recording I'd be checking these EB1s the dimensions that we've provided the dimensions that we've provided for the SF1 300 by 300 in this case and make sure they align on the main part of the plan the set down dimensions there's two types SF2 and SF3 where the patio is so we've called that EB2 where there's saw cut joints where there's shower rebates and I don't think I mentioned that but they're shown in these locations so in the middle of the slab according to the floor plan there's a shower in this area and we've actually made the slab a little bit lower there and that's the detail finally where we want EB1 to continue as as SF1 we've given a detail for that as well so the engineer's done a really good job on this one 
Finally, we're just going to make sure that these project specific notes are specific to the project. So in this case, some of the information has been removed for the recording, but we've given the lot and plan number. The site has some fall, it's not, and we've asked the builder to refer any problems to us. That there's not overland flow, there's not trees near the house. Um, that the site conditions are as per the soil test, and that there aren't any sewer mains adjacent to the building. Our notes for the concrete masonry are here. We ref reference AS3700, which was the Australian standard and the year applicable at the time this job was done. We talk about the mortar classification, the strength of the core fill, um, and that we want the corners all bonded. We talk about how we want the soil placed and compacted underneath the house, including the sand and the fill that's directly underneath the slab, which as we saw in the details is a little bit higher than the natural ground. We talk about our requirements for, in the concrete section, our requirements for the concrete. So it's N20, normal grade concrete. Um, and for the slabs, we've gone actually upper grade N25 concrete. We talk about how we want the reinforcement shown, or how the reinforcement has been shown diagrammatically. We talk about the grades of steel and the Australian standards that they are to be supplied to. And we talk about, most importantly, or one of the important things, how to cure the concrete to give the concrete the best chance to perform, to harden beef rather than cracking. Over here we have our notes for structural timber and we've referenced, referenced AS 1720, the Australian standard for timber construction. Uh, we talk about rejecting the wrong kind of timber, abnormally green or split timber. Um, we're using MGP 12 of junk joint group JD4 or better. Uh, so now the timber supplier knows what kind of timber to supply. We've talked about bolts and screws that they're all detailed in accordance with AS1720. Talked about plywood that needs to be stamped as structural grade plywood. Uh, these couple of other notes, uh, bolts in contact with CCA which probably don't, doesn't apply to this house and if there's no other details given, if we haven't given a detail on connection details or or tie down, or how walls are connected to each other, then the builder is to refer to AS 1684.3 2010, the Australian standard for residential timber frame construction, relevant at the time of this record, um, at the time this job was done. And then finally, we're checking to make sure that the wind speed is right. So I know from local knowledge on this job that it was Region C, it was in a cyclone area, it was train cat category two, there was no buildings around this. It's part, beg your pardon, partially shielded, one or two buildings, but generally fairly flat land. The topographic factor talks about is in relation to how flat or or how much slope there is on the land. There's no factor, there's no no um no increase in wind due to topographic. So it's T0 and we've classified the site as C2. So the, the builder now knows what the wind speed is for this building and you can check that to make sure the trusses are supplied correctly, that the glazing, the, the windows are supplied for the correct wind classification and here we talk about that internal pressure coefficient that we had on the other page as well. The floors are designed on the balcony for 2 kPa which is about 200 kilograms per square metre. The internal floor inside the house is designed for 1.5 kPa and the roof is designed for about 25 kilograms per square metre and the truss manufacturer is going to take that into account and make sure that he's going to make sure he provides trusses that are strong enough to take 25 kilograms per square metre which is really just a maintenance load of builders working on the roof. We don't expect anyone to be living up there. So there you have it, we've started at the back of this set and we've worked away from, from the top down, we've worked through the roof, through the walls, through to the slab and then we've checked our project specific notes to make sure all that applies and is relevant and correctly specifies how the, how the builder needs to build this house. So we are just about done. The only thing that's left now is for the RPQ engineer to fill in to fill in the form 15, which is the compliance certificate. 
to say that the engineering complies with, and with what Australian standards. So let's get, clean this up a bit. So don't forget this is an old Form 15. This is an old job in general. Um, and this form has actually been changed slightly. But the information is pretty much the same. We talk about what street address, so the street address for the actual house, lot and plan, which is the surveyor's plan numbers, and what local government this building is being built in. Um, these are the things that we are responsible and that we're saying do comply. The footings, the slab, the concrete masonry walls, timber posts, wall frame, we've spoken about all these things, the wall bracing, the lintels over the windows, the roof beams out in the patio, the alfresco in the entry, and how the roof trusses are being tied down to, these, to the walls for our single story residence as shown on our drawings. So that all looks great. The Australian standards that we've referenced in this design are these ones, and these are all correct and current at the time of, of the job, that the job was done. We use the Concrete Masonry Association's Single Leaf Masonry Design Manual. We've confirmed here the wind speed in case this piece of paper gets separated from the drawings. The builder can um, use this to confirm what the wind speed is for this building. Pressure coefficients, talked about the roller doors quickly, but this is a whole different video that the door frames are compliant with AS4505. Um, we talk about our drawings, so this is what we're actually certifying, or this is the documents that we've that we've used to consider this design. Our drawings, the floor plans by the building designer, the site test, site report, the trust plan and reaction report. We leave this one blank and then I fill in my details. I work at Cornell Engineers. Our detail, contact details will appear here. I'll sign in this pot, spot and I'll put the date in, the day that I sign this form. And then that gets PDF'd and sent to the builder along with these plans. And now that we're happy with them, I tell you what, we're going to go over here, create a new folder called Issued. This is how we do it internally at Cornell Engineers. Put the date in, in reverse uh, date location. So 1-2016-05-14th um, of May 2016. And we're just going to move those plans in there. I didn't do that very well, did I? Okay, so now that those plans are in issued, and once I've signed that Form 15, this job is ready to go to the builder and go get built. Um, he's already got this information because he's already given us this information, but we keep it on file just in case anyone needs it. Um, so look, thank you very much for joining me. I'm Matt Cornell. We've just been through the design checking process on a sample house plan. Um, we've started with an email from the builder. We've had a look at the plans that we've received and the other information that we've received. We've put, gone through the drawings that our engineer has prepared and we've been really happy with them. It's been a good job. The plans have been put into issued and the RPQ engineer, this is a Queensland job, signs a form 15, turns it into a PDF and sends it off to the builder who then sends it to the certifier for building approval. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you got something out of this. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and we'll see if we can help you. Thank you very much.